Retirement Tips Radio is brought to you by Business Radio X, the voice of business in your community. Currently serving over 25 markets, the Business Radio X network is growing fast. We're teaming up with retired execs and established entrepreneurs to support and celebrate local business leaders. If you'd like to make additional income while making a difference, discover more at brxteam.com. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Retirement Tips Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today we have with us Karsten Yeska, and he is with Early Retirement Now. Welcome, Karsten. Thanks for having me. Well, before we get too far into things, tell us about what you're up to. How are you serving folks? Um, I'm a blogger, uh, and I retired two years ago from a busy corporate career. And uh, so even before retiring, I already had my blog. And uh, so that was just mostly chronicling my uh, my path to early retirement. And uh, so now that I'm retired, I, I keep blogging and writing about um, how to achieve early retirement, how to live in early retirement, how to how to do the financial planning around retirement uh, and early retirement, how to make sure you don't run out of money uh, over the next 30, 40 or 50 or even 60 years. And uh, so that's that's why I uh, still write on my blog. It's called earlyretirementnow.com. Now, um, what does early retirement mean? I would think that in today's world where a lot of people are working from home, they might be working, but they are kind of living on their own terms with their flexible lifestyle at their house. Um, is, has the definition of retirement changed? Uh, yeah, for us, I mean, it's not like we are doing the traditional retirement, uh, live in Florida and play bingo uh, or, or play golf the whole day. So for, for us, early retirement means, uh, I mean, we, we have a school age daughter, so uh, she keeps us busy. Um, I have a blog. Uh, I do a little bit of financial consulting on the side. I make a little bit of money uh, on the side with the blog. So it's, it's not the it, it's not my parents or grandparents' traditional retirement. That's that's for sure. Right. So it isn't like back in the day you would work somewhere for a long time, and then right. at a certain age everybody just called it a day. You might got a pension from that company. Uh, you might have your own investments. And you're close to Social Security, so that's going to kick in. That was what, I guess, maybe another generation or generation ago pictured in their head what retirement is. But in today's world, you know, with this financial independence, retire early kind of um, movement that started, that, that people look at this differently, right? Just their whole mindset has shifted around what it is like is working part of retirement. It seems to be in a lot of cases that, you know, you, you're working on a blog. So that's kind of work in some regards. Some people would yeah. think that that's not work, but I mean, I'm sure it, it feels like work in a lot of ways. Yeah. It sometimes feels like work, you know, you have, uh, obviously I, if I don't want to publish, uh, anything for three weeks, I don't have to. Right. But I mean, you still feel a little bit compelled. You, it, it still feels like you have some deadlines. Uh, you have uh, every day you get emails, you, people comment on your blog posts and you feel compelled to reply. Uh, in, in some way it's even worse than some work in the corporate world where you, I mean, you have to find hours and you have weekends where you don't work uh, is it almost seems like a, a blog or or any kind of other side business that that people do when uh, when they retire early uh this this it's it's it's, uh, it's more unpredictable work and uh, so you almost have to be on your best uh, behavior uh, all the time whereas uh, with the with the corporate job you uh, you have more defined work hours so so in yeah, it's 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 very different from traditional retirement obviously so now is the, in your definition of retirement, is it like more kind of living on your own terms with your own rules? Right, right. And and again, uh, so I set up my retirement planning, obviously. I mean, if my blog went away tomorrow, uh, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't have to to starve or anything, right? So, I mean, I planned my early retirement that we have enough passive income from dividends and interest and, and capital gains that I never have to work again and I never have to blog again. So, so for me, the the blogging is mostly to uh, to stay 
mentally sharp and uh, stay stay engaged and also uh, you you get to meet a lot of people right uh, so especially before the whole pandemic right this is a very active community you, you locally you you meet a lot of people uh, you go to conferences uh, you go to uh, uh, to, to to smaller events where where bloggers meet or or other like minded people meet to to talk about the, the early retirement planning now that has that has come a little bit to a standstill now uh, but i'm sure that's that's going to pick up again so again i mean for me it's a it's a hobby i make a little bit of extra income on the side and uh, it just keeps you mentally sharp and, and, and engaged socially, too. Now, is that one of the challenges of being retired is this kind of you got to do something every day, right? Like you got to fill 24 hours every day and you might as well do something you like and something that's adding meaning to your life. I mean, there's only I would imagine I'm not retired yet, but there's only so much golf you can play or only so much fishing you right. can do. I mean, at some point, that sounds like a good idea, maybe when you're dreaming about it, but when you're actually living it, you, it may not be as attractive every single day. Yeah, and, and so you have to find hobbies that that, that keep you engaged. I mean, so I, I, I always push back uh, when, when people say, well, in order to retire early, you almost have to have an early retirement block, which is uh, not, not everybody who retires early can have a retirement blog, right? Because they, we would have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of blogs. Uh, and uh, so I, I know plenty of people who are completely retired and they don't do the blogging thing, but they do something else, right? So they have some other passion projects. Um, a lot of them, I mean, for a lot of them, their, their kids are their passion project, right? They, they do a lot of volunteering in school, uh, and uh, it obviously helped in in the spring, right? Schools shut down; they had to basically do homeschooling. So that that kept us on a uh, on a pretty good schedule every day, it's, it's certainly every weekday. Uh, so as everybody has their own little uh, uh, niche of of how they of how they are happy in retirement and in, in, in early retirement. So when you were going about the planning process, at some point in your working life, you were like, you know what, I think I'm going to retire early, right? Like, so that was kind of right. a, a mental shift for you to say, okay, I'm going to aim at this point or this time or this age to retire. Right. And then um, has what you imagine retirement being, is it what it is? Yeah, for the most part, it is. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, I always say that uh, it's not like there was this bliss and and great increase of happiness the day I retired, right? So, uh, it's 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 what I expected, and uh, it's it's not like my my entire work life was miserable, and then I have this bliss and happiness suddenly in retirement. I, I think my my entire life was 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 pretty happy. I, I had a very rewarding job rewarding in in every sense i worked in finance for uh for almost my entire life and uh, so i always found that very interesting and um so uh, yeah so in, in in that sense i uh, the retirement is, is as expected so we uh we moved away from a very high cost of living area to a uh, still a relatively high cost living area, but it's much lower cost than, than where we used to live. We live in uh, Washington state, uh, not in Seattle, but just out of Portland. And uh, so yeah, I was, I was really looking forward to uh, more of a suburban, quieter, uh, more relaxed life. We, we used to, we used to work, uh, live in a very small apartment in San Francisco. And now we have a single family house uh, out in the suburbs here. So, I mean, that, that's what I was really looking forward to that. And this, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, we are very happy here. And uh, so it really has worked out the, the way we imagined. So now let's talk about some, maybe some advice for folks out there that are contemplating doing this is it, what, did you have a number in mind? Like I've heard different kind of schools of thought regarding, right. uh, okay, I have to have whatever, $2 million. I saw an article the other day, the guy said $8 million. Um, like, I, you know, I've seen all kinds of numbers of what you aim at. And then when you have that, then you can kind of flip the switch. But then I've heard also other things of, well, it, your cash flow is what matters, your monthly right. cash flow and what kind of lifestyle you lead. That's really the thing to worry about. So um, do you have an opinion about that? 
Oh yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, it it depends on what kind of a retirement budget you're aiming for, right? So the rule of thumb is: so imagine you have no other income, no other, and also no other future income, right? Because I I'm still going to have a small pension that starts in about ten years. Uh, I'm going to have social security, which I probably want to push out all the way until age 70 to to max out that uh, that spousal. It's a little bit of an arbitrage you can do there. Uh, and uh, but so imagine you you had never any additional income uh, and never additional cash flows like social security, and you want to withdraw, uh, say, a hundred thousand dollars every year and adjust that for inflation. So there is a rule of thumb and the rule of thumb is called the 4% rule. And the 4% rule says that if you have a, a relatively uh, balanced, diversified portfolio, say anywhere between 60% and 75% stocks and the rest uh, long-term bonds, uh, then you can withdraw about 4% of that portfolio in the first year and then do the adjustments uh, according to inflation every year and that should last for 30 years, probably even a little bit longer than 30 years, uh, basically until until the traditional retiree dies. And maybe if you do it a little bit more cautiously and say you withdraw only maybe 3.5% or 3.3, 3 3.4, 3 3.5% uh, of your initial net worth, uh, that should last, That then your money should last uh, maybe even 50 to 60 years. So there, I, I did some some back tests and simulations. And I, I think if you had retired right at the peak, right before uh, the Great Depression, right before uh, the big stock market bust in 1929, yeah, I mean, you, if you take down your withdrawal rate all the way to maybe into the low 3%, you would have still lasted, uh, your portfolio would have still lasted uh, 50 years or 60 years and never run out of money. So, so if you look at uh, what is your budget, how much do you need every month, every year, uh, and you multiply that by, by 25, that would uh, get you through a traditional retirement. And if you maybe multiply it by, let's make it a round number, you multiply that by 30. Uh, I mean, you will definitely never run out of money. So, and in the, even in the worst possible case, you wouldn't run out of money. And actually in the best possible case, after that many decades, you, you will have, Potentially, I mean, in the best possible case, you have many times, uh, you, you, you would have many times multiplied your initial uh, net worth and you can leave a pretty nice size bequest and use that for, for all your charity needs and, 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 and give, give money to your, to your loved ones when you pass away. So, there, yeah, I mean, there are obviously some, uh, some rules of thumb. And uh, so my lesson that I learned uh, from, from looking at a lot of these uh, uh, retirement uh, safe withdrawal planning challenges is this is really a very, uh, it has to be a very personalized analysis. So you, because nobody, so I mean, I retired at age 44 and uh, yeah, I mean, I will have some additional income in the future. So I could actually, uh, what I withdraw now, I will probably have to scale that down in the future because, first of all, Social Security will kick in at some point. Even if I give Social Security a haircut and say, well, there might be some political risk and I might get less than uh, than what I'm what I was promised, uh, even if I get half the Social Security, uh, I, I can still reduce my withdrawals in the future. And if you take that into account, then you, you might even increase your withdrawals a little bit uh, in the beginning. So, but yeah, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, good rules of thumbs. And then if you, if you start looking more into the details, you, uh, you, you will, uh, uh, you, you will find that, I mean, there's, there's some planning tools that you can use to, uh, to decide how much you need, depending on uh, how much you need in terms of one net worth number today in order to satisfy your cash flow needs over time. Now, does the fact that the interest rates are so low nowadays, historically low, uh, impact any of those rules of thumb? Because yes. at one point there was a time, you know, where you can get a decent amount of money from interest, where that number is pretty difficult to achieve in today's market. And then but the stock market is going crazy. So has that balance shifted where it used to be like a 60, 40, 70, 30 split? Has that changed any? Yeah, so uh, very good point. So I think uh, that's, that is actually one of my main 
uh, points on my blog that you can't just calculate a safe withdrawal rate without taking into account where you find yourself in life today, right? Where is where are interest rates and where are equity valuations? And I mean, if you if you look back through history, uh, and, and by the way, it's it's not just the the nominal interest rate, right? It's also the inflation environment because interest rates have been low, had been low before. So, uh, and uh, interest rates were really high during the 70s, but you also had a lot of inflation during the 1970s. So, uh, so, uh, so what I found is that uh, the determinants, if you look at the determinants, what, uh, what do you want to use as your, as your safe withdrawal rate? It's actually equity valuations are the, the biggest determinant and not so much the bond interest. Rate. Of course, if you, if you have a 100% bond portfolio, yes, then absolutely you should look at exclusively uh, what are your bond uh, interest rates. Uh, and, uh, but most investors uh, take on a little bit more risk and they have some equities in their portfolio. And if you have something like 60 to 70 or 70, 75% equities in your portfolio, you look at the, the volatility of that portfolio, uh, 90 or 95% of the volatility of that portfolio comes from equity volatility. And uh, so, yeah, it, absolutely. If you look at, so, so you actually equity valuations, that is, the, that is the main determinant of how much money you should withdraw. And if you find yourself at a, at a multi-year peak, uh, again, in the stock market, then absolutely you have to be a little bit more cautious about your about your safe withdrawal rate. And then, on the other hand, if if you had retired at the bottom of the bear market, say in in, uh, in two thousand two or three or in two thousand nine, uh, you would be crazy to withdraw only four percent from a uh, from a diversified portfolio. You can you probably have to jack that up to five percent or six percent. So yes, absolutely. So uh, your withdrawal rate should depend on not just your idiosyncratic uh, parameters, but also uh, market valuation, and especially stock market valuation. If, if you have a, a portfolio that's mostly, that's mostly in stocks. Now, once you hit the, once you're like saying, okay, now today's the day, yesterday I, I was working and today I'm retired. Does my, and I know, okay, say hypothetically, I'm going to pull out a hundred thousand dollars a year. Am I, so I would assume that my big pile of money, my nest egg, I'm reinvesting at those rates. Am I still taking some of my hundred thousand dollars that I've allocated to live on and investing that as well? Or I'm just kind of, um, just kind of reinvesting dividends and reinvesting things, um, on my portfolio. Uh, so, I mean, if you take out a hundred thousand dollars and you consume sixty thousand and you reinvest forty thousand in something else, uh, you should not consider that a hundred thousand dollar withdrawal, right? You should look at the net numbers. Right? You should consider that a sixty thousand dollar net withdrawal. And uh, uh, so, in fact, and, and if that's the case, you should you should probably only withdraw the sixty thousand dollars and and keep the forty thousand dollars in place and not touch them because of tax considerations that you don't want to create unnecessary uh, capital gains on your tax return. But I mean, some people obviously face this problem uh, because of required minimum distributions, right? So they might have to withdraw more uh, because of the RMDs uh, more than they need to live on. And then they, yeah, I mean, in that case, you would reinvest your your excess distributions, but that's, I, I think that's relatively rare. And especially you know, for early retirees, you, you don't have to worry about requirement, uh, required minimum distributions. I think that now starts at age 72. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, for 99% of the people, what you should do is you, you should really look only at what, what is your net retirement budget and, and how much do you need to live on? And, uh, and that should be exactly what you withdraw. And then um, is your kind of the portfolio, do you adjust your risk based on your age as you like, as you're getting, is it kind of like rocket right. ship in stages where you're like, okay, you know, you're in the mid forties now. So from mid forties to mid fifties, I'm going to have this kind of aggressive of a portfolio. And then maybe as I get older, I'm going to kind of taper off some of that risk. 
Um, I mean, there, there are different schools of thought, right? I mean, there's the whole idea of, I mean, there, there's some there's some guidance obviously out there. I mean, you you look at what target date funds do, right? They have some sort of a, 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 a asset allocation depending on where you are relative to your retirement date, not so much your age, but your retirement date. And uh, so what they do is, uh, during the last few years of your working career, they definitely take down the equity allocation quite substantially because you, uh, and, and this takes off a little bit of the risk right around your retirement date. You, you don't want to have, you certainly do, you don't want to have a hundred percent equities right at your retirement date, right? Because if you, if you're one of these unlucky cohorts in, in history, say people who retired in 1929 or in the 60s or early 70s or 2000 or 2007, if you had had 100% equities right around that time, um, you might have uh, so much of a drop in your portfolio and then you start taking the withdrawals uh, that uh, even with the eventual bull market again, uh, you depleted your portfolio so badly uh, that you'll never recover from that. So that's uh, so. This 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 concept is called sequence of return risk. That uh, the the risk is that you have very poor returns right at the beginning of your retirement, from from which you will never uh, recover. Uh, so so there are some rules of thumb that say yes, right around your retirement date. Uh, you probably don't want to be uh, that equity heavy anymore. And I normally recommend something like 60 to, uh, to 75% equities. And the funny thing is, I mean, because you, you mentioned bond returns are so low because people get, get uh, really nervous about very expensive equities. We're now at all time highs again, or, or close to the all time highs, uh, and depending on what, what index you look at, but as actually bonds seem to be, really, really uh, overvalued because it, the yields are so low. And uh, uh, so, so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's really a two-edged sword. It's a, yes, I mean, you want, to, you want to have a little bit less equities because equities are so expensive. But I mean, look what's the alternative, right? A, this, uh, this, uh, this acronym TINA, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. So you almost, because equities, because everything, all asset classes are really so expensive, uh, and, and yields are so low, earnings yield in equities and equities and dividend yields are relatively low, bond yields are so low, you almost have to shift a little bit more into equities just to get the, the expected return that you need to get you through the next 30, 40, or 50 years. So the, 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 uh, the, the ironic recommendation because of this, the, this extremely high valuation of all of the different asset classes is this, it's, it's, uh, it's, Intriguingly, you, you want to increase your equity valuation, right? Because if, if you had bond interest rates at 10% and equities uh, uh, with, uh, with 4, 5, 6% dividend yield, uh, uh, yeah, then you could even afford to have more bonds, right? So now everything is so expensive, you almost can't afford to have, uh, to have a lot of bond diversification because the yields are so low. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a real... It's a real conundrum that uh, what what should retirees do right now? So it's, in fact, it has turned out that say everybody who retired any time between 2015 to, to 2018 or even 2020, uh, they have actually done relatively well with uh, with more than 60% equities. It's just just because of that reason, bond yields are so low. You have to put your money somewhere. You have to get your expected return. You have to pump up that expected return to get through so many decades. Uh, you you yeah you put more money in in stocks and uh, uh, and it has worked out relatively well uh, over the last five years. So we'll, we'll see how it how it works out over the next ten years. And these are some of the topics and conversations you're dealing with on your blog on a regular basis, right? Right. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yep. And if somebody wanted to uh, check out the blog and uh, maybe get on your subscriber list, what's the website again? Uh, EarlyRetirementNow.com. It's just one long word. And there's a, there's a link to subscribe. Um, you can uh, look through my my. Uh, uh, list of all posts that I've ever written. So my, my little claim to fame in the blogging community is that I have written a series about the exactly some of the things that we talked about, the, the challenges of withdrawing money and doing it in a way that, uh, that you don't run out of money. 
uh, and it's it's called the Safe Withdrawal Rate series. And there's a there's a link at the top of the of the blog at the at the main menu. And this, this is I, I think half of the traffic to my blog just is is for that series. Wow, that, so that's a great place to start. Yeah. Well, Karsten, thank you so much for sharing your story today. You're doing such important work and helping so many people. Thank you so much. And that website, one more time, is earlyretirementnow.com. Karsten, thank you again for sharing your story. Thanks. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Retirement Tips Radio. Retirement Tips Radio is brought to you by Business Radio X, the voice of business in your community. Currently serving over 25 markets, the Business Radio X network is growing fast. We're teaming up with retired execs and established entrepreneurs to support and celebrate local business leaders. If you'd like to make additional income while making a difference, discover more at brxteam.com.